this virus is a whole big question mark. So I think we'll have a better idea probably in a month or more from now. We'll see how things shaked out in the healthcare system and what the impacts are like. So I don't know. September's still a big question mark. Um, <laughs> excuse me, wet 100 and wet 120, no decision has been made yet. We're still, still a month and a, two weeks out from now. So we kind of don't want to pull the plug until we absolutely have to, just because these courses are mandatory to graduate. And if we don't run them, it's going to affect some students' ability to graduate uh, in, in uh, December. And so we really would like to run them. Um, the other options we're looking at running wet 100 and wet 120 in August, which sounds pretty lousy to me because I think people are going to be working and I'm going to be sitting on a beach if I have my way. Um, and yeah, Stephanie, your assessment about there's nothing new coming or so it seems. You might be a little bit hooped. I mean, this this virus seems to just be putting a hammer down on just about everything. And I was thinking about, I was listening to the Prime Minister talk this morning about the EI, and it sounds like it's good for a whole bunch of folks, but one of the groups he didn't mention was students who would normally be working during the summer. So I don't know. But yes, if you can use the time to focus on health and wellness, it's a good thing. So what I'd like to do, folks, is I'd like to get back into that example that we started last class. And so this is where we have this pump shown here. And we wanted to ask some questions about it. So the first thing I said is when this pump is operating at a nine inch diameter impeller and the demand is 175 gallons per minute, what is the total head and what is the pump efficiency? Okay. So I would also like to add in there that I'd like to, sorry, come on. There we go. I'd also like to find the brake horsepower because we're going to need to do that anyways for the next two parts. So if we go back and we look at this, if this example here, when we're trying to find what the total head and the efficiency are, and then we'll have to do a little calculations to find the brake horsepower when we're operating at 175 five gallons per minute. We start at 175 gallons per minute. We read up until we hit the efficiency curve. And then we read over and we read off the efficiency, which is, I think, somewhere around 58%. We continue moving up until we hit our pump curve. And then we read over. And that is our total dynamic head which is approximately 350 feet. So we've answered the first two things, but what we need to do now is we need to figure out what is our brake horsepower. Does anybody want to throw out a suggestion to how we figure that out? So we're looking for our brake horsepower. Do we know any equations where we know our brake horsepower? Give you a hand. Okay. So if we reorg this formula, to solve for brake horsepower. Yep, you got it. We've got our 
water horsepower divided by our efficiency. Now we know our efficiency, we just read that off our chart, is equal to 58% or 0 0.58, okay? But we don't know what our water horsepower is. Is there any way we can figure out what that is? Sure, we can use this formula. Good morning to all the students who are arriving. So in this case, we don't know what our water horsepower is, but we have the ability to find it because we know what our flow rate is and we know our total dynamic head. So our flow rate at this particular one is 175 gallons per minute. Our total dynamic head we read off of our chart is equal to um, 350 feet. So we can, and those conveniently enough are in the correct units to plug directly into our formula. So we can come up with a water horsepower. So 175 GPM times by 350 feet divided by 3960. And that gives us our water horsepower which I'm going to wait for you guys to do. Okay, so Brady's throwing out 15.5. And the units for that are going to be horsepower. Can anybody confirm Brady's number, please? Okay, great. Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Does anybody want to disagree before we move on to the next step? Okay, so when we go back to our original formula here, We've now got the water horsepower. So that's the amount of work that the pump is, a, is imparting. The efficiency is coming from, okay, first with Quinn, the efficiency we read off the pump curve or the efficiency curve on the pump diagram. And the 396 is a conversion factor or 3,960 is the conversion factor, Josh, that's included in the formula. We have two formulas for horsepower, one for metric and one for imperial, and this is the one that I'm using for imperial. So if you flip back a couple pages in your note, you'll see it. Okay, good. All right, so now we've got our efficiency, which we read off our graph. We've got our water horsepower, which we calculated using the information we took off our graph. We can now calculate our brake horsepower. So our brake horsepower, is going to be equal to our water horsepower, 15.5 horsepower, divided by our efficiency, which is 0 0.58. And we end up with a brake horsepower of 26.7 horsepower. Okay, Ryder's throwing out that. Does anybody else want to confirm? Okay. We'll just give everybody just another minute here. Great. Now, horsepower, so this is the amount of energy that the motor has to deliver to the pump. Okay, then the pump takes that energy and 
is able to do some work with it. So we are able to do 15.5 horsepower of work with it, but the sort of 10-ish horsepower that the pump puts in that's gone missing, that's lost to friction and heat and vibration and noise and all sorts of stuff. So not all the energy we put into the pump is going to be used for actually moving the water or adding uh, energy head to the water. Now, similar to a pipe, there's no way we can get a pump that's sized for 26.7 horsepower. Uh, this is pump curve example one, Stuart. So in, thanks Johnson. So basically when we're looking at this, we would say we would probably need to go up and have a pump that could deliver at least 30 horsepower, the next size up. Okay, because they deliver pumps in standard sizes, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 50 horsepower. So no one ever creates a pump that delivers 26.7 horsepower or a motor, pardon me. All right, so we've done the first step of this particular example. So I'm going to go back and switch to my other screen again. I wish I could keep two screens open at the same time, but I don't appear to have that option. Okay. So for this particular, the next stage here is I want, if we take this pump and we change the speed that the pump is operating at, so if we take a look at our pump curve, we have our pump and it is operating at 3,200 RPMs. Now I want to know what happens if I reduce my RPMs down to the 2,500 RPMs, okay? And in order to do that, I need to use the affinity laws, okay? And so I'm just going to put up a blank screen again so that we can... Do some calculations together. <coughs> Excuse me. So our affinity laws when we are changing our impeller speed are these relationships here. And then and in this case, what we're trying to solve for in each one of these is what's our flow rate going to be if we change our speed, what's our head going to be, and what is our brake horsepower. So this, this is not pressure, it's brake horsepower. Okay, so we would rearrange and solve for our Q2 is going to be equal to Q1, N2 over N1. Our head is going to be equal to head one, okay. N2 squared divided by N1 squared. And again, our power two is going to be equal to our power one and two cubed divided by N one cubed. And so for these examples, our Q one was equal to 175 gallons per minute. Our head was equal to 350 GPM. And our um, brake horsepower we figured out was equal to 26.7. So now we, this, which is equal to P1. So now we have the information that we need to plug these into your formulas and pop out with our revised Qs. So for example, Q2 is going to be 175 GPM times our N2, which is 2,500, 
divided by our, our original RPM. And we end up with Are you guys still there? You're awfully quiet. Is head one measured in feet or GPM? Head is also always in feet, Stephanie. Oh, shoot. I see what you mean. Ha <laughs> ha. Thanks. Feet. Does that make you feel better? Okay, 137 GPM. Okay, so thank you for confirming Sawyer Kyra's number. So does this number of 137 gallons per minute make sense? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yes, it does. So thank you for the responses. Yeah, and it's it just makes sense. We're literally slowing the speed at the impeller spinning. So we're just getting less flow rate out of it. So if it, it makes kind of sense, right? So when you're look when you're doing these affinity laws, you should know whether or not the um, head or the flow rate or the power requirements are going to go up or go down. So if you put in a bigger impeller than the one you started with, all of your parameters are going to get bigger. If you put a littler impeller in, they're all going to get littler. If you reduce the speed, they're all going to get littler. If you increase the speed, they're all going to get bigger. Okay. So what I would like everybody to do is to take a moment and I would like you to solve for H2. And I'd like you to solve for your power, too. I don't want to erase my whole screen here. So I think you guys have all the parameters up, and you can plug them in. So I should put that up here, here. N1 plus 3,200. That was right off the graph. So, um, this particular pump curve was created for when the pump was spinning at 3200 rpm so you just read it off the graph there okay and i really appreciate that you guys are responding in the chat room on this it would be really tough to do this without you all talking to me. Okay, so Sawyer's so throwing out 273 feet and 20.9 horsepower. Would anybody like to confirm that? Ryder's giving us a thumbs up. Okay, need at least one more thumbs up before we can move on here. Okay, awesome. So does anybody have any questions about using the affinity laws for the change in speed? Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do the exact same thing, only now we're going to use the affinity laws for the impeller. 
Wait, is it all right if I clear the screen here? Does everybody have this written down? Okay, I'm hearing no screams of keep it up. Oh, 214 meter. You should be working in, in feet, Quinn. Okay. So it looks like we are having a 200 and 13 feet. Seems to be winning out. Does everybody feel better about that? Oh yeah, keep in mind, just remember folks, we got a square, remember? These are to the squares and these are to the power of three. No, that's okay. That's why we're doing this together as a team. Okay, we're redefining our, we're getting uh, 12.7. Sorry, my, it's really hard to write on this screen. Does everybody feel better with that number? Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, let's give everybody a couple more, another minute or so here to make some notes. And then we'll move on to part B of the problem. Okay, so I'm just going to erase this as long as no one protests. And we're going to do now the same thing, but we're going to change our impeller size. So the affinity laws that we are going to use for changing impeller are these ones. So they're very similar. And again, notice the squares. So in this case, we're gonna be solving for Q2. And if we look at all of the parameters that we have, our Q1 was 175 GPM. D1 is equal to uh, nine inches. D2 is equal to 10 inches. Um, our head one was 350 feet. 
and our power one was equal to 26.7. So how's everybody doing with the calculations? Okay, so these are the numbers that Wanda's thrown out, and Josh has confirmed the flow rate. I would really like it if we could get a few more thumbs up or uh, alternative answers. Okay, great, fantastic. So does everybody feel comfortable using the affinity laws? I don't think they're particularly hard. You just have to know what the incoming values are. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Oh, that's a good question, Francine. The short answer when you're using the affinity laws is it really doesn't matter the units that you're putting things in as long as they were all the same. So if you're using your impellers in inches, D1 is in inches, then D2 has to be in inches. Or if your uh, head is in, head one is in meters, head two has to be in meters. So it really doesn't matter what unit you use, it they just have to be consistent. If your flow rate is in, liters per second, both flow rates have to be in liters per second. Okay, great, awesome. So what we're gonna do is take a look at our next um, example that we're doing. And it's a bit more complicated and what I'd like you all to do is break out your colored pens, if you've got them handy. And uh, for some reason, Collaborate really doesn't like these diagrams and won't show them correctly. So I'm going to have to flip and share my screen. So just be calm while I make that happen. It's going to look a little bit weird for a moment. Aha, uh -huh, it's a little crazy. Okay, so everybody just be calm. I'm going to go and look here. Whew. All right, so what I've got up here is the pump curve example number two. And you'll see that this is looking quite a bit more complicated than our previous example. So what we're going to do is we're, <coughs> excuse me, is we're going to break it down and basically highlight in different colors what all the curves mean. So we're going to take a look at what the next one, or sorry, I'm going to put the next color in. 
So can everybody see that there that I've highlighted the actual pump curves themselves in red? And you'll notice that these pump curves uh, change based on diameter. So I've got, if you'll look here, um, whoa, sorry, I'm just undo that, undo. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how I can do this while you guys can see it. Um, let's do that. Okay, I'm hoping this works. Whoa. But if you look up in the top corner, or the top left corner, you'll see the diameters that I've got going on. And then it goes from 10, 10 and 3 30 second inch diameter, 10 inch diameter, 9 inch diameter, 8 inch, 7 inch. So basically, you'll notice that as we put in a smaller impeller inside the pump volume, the amount of head we can generate and the amount of flow weight that we can generate um, goes down. So I'm just going to go back and look at my other screen for a second. Does anybody have any questions about that? Sorry, I just have to go in here to see your content or see your comments. I can't see them in my other screen. Okay. All right, everybody seems comfortable with that. Now the next one I want you to all highlight is the efficiency curves. Now, when we're plotting efficiency on sort of a type of curve like this, where you're plotting more than one, uh, more than one pump curve on the same graph, they they change how the efficiency is presented. So I've highlighted them in green, and so you can take a look. The highest efficiencies we have are located. Um, are above 75% efficiency. And then as we put a lower and or a smaller and smaller impeller into our, uh, into our pump, it gets less and less efficient. So what that's telling me is that this pump is actually designed to work best with a 10 and 3 30 second inch impeller in it. Okay. You can put smaller impellers in it, but you are going to, your efficiency is going to suffer. Also, you'll notice as you get to the right, when you're operating at very high flow rates, our efficiency also starts to drop off. And again, the same thing when you're forcing your pump to operate at very low flow rates as we approach the shutoff heads, our efficiencies also drop off. Okay. So and I'm just going to flip back to the other screen again so that I can see if you have any questions. So no questions from anybody on that? Okay. So green is the efficiency. Yes, that is correct, Kyra. And red is the pump curves, and those pump curves change based on impeller size. Okay, all right, so now we're going to go to the next screen because we've got more information on there. Now, the next one we have on here is the net positive suction head required. So these are the blue lines. And you'll notice on the right side, it says at the end of each blue line, there is a number that says 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet of net positive suction head. Okay. So those are how much net positive suction head the pump requires to keep it performing well. And you'll notice the faster we make the water move through our pump at the high end of the flows, the more net positive suction head is required. And that's because when we have high flow rates, we have high velocities, which means we have high head losses inside of our pump. Okay. 
Okay. How does everybody feel about the net positive suction head? Yes, net positive suction head. And that's, yeah, blue is net positive suction head. Okay, I'm gonna go back into my other screen. Oh, I got another comment. Yeah, there's, thank you, Michael. If you look at the back of your sections, there's bigger versions of these. I should have mentioned that right up ahead, friend. They're also in your textbook. All right, so I'm going to go back to the other screens and we're going to look at the final one again. Now, this one here is our brake horsepower. So this is how much energy our pump is demanding to work. So this is the orange lines is brake horsepower. All right, so then the, the question that I am asking you is when you're operating the pump with the eight inch diameter impeller and the demand is 500 gallons per minute, what's the total head, the pump efficiency, the net positive suction head required and the brake horsepower? So what you're going to do is you take your chart and you identify where 500 gallons per minute is along the X axis. And then you're going to draw a line straight up until you hit the eight inch diameter pump curve. So if I just go back. And so we find our 500 gallons per minute on the bottom. And then we go up until we hit the eight inch pump curve, which is right here. So if I look at that on the next page, so we're 500 and we go up to here. So that is our operation point right there. Okay. So the first thing we want to know is what the total head is. And so once you found your pump curve and where it is intersected by the 500 gallons per minute, you read directly across to the left to read off your total head in feet. So can someone tell me what that is? Okay, so 17-ish, yeah, that seems about right to me. Okay. And then, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same idea, but this time we're going to do it for the efficiency. And I'm going to go back to my screen again, and I'm going to, whoop, sorry, there's another comment. Yeah, Johnson, okay, good. We're all seem to be on the same wavelength here. I'm going to go back into my screen. And so we're going to do the same thing now for efficiency. And so I'm going to flip to my efficiency curve. So I'm going to just start at 500 gallons per minute. And I'm just going to go here. 500 gallons per minute. I'm going to go up until I hit my 8-inch pump curve. There I am. 
And now you'll notice that I'm partway between um, my efficiency that's 65% and 70%, but I'm closer to 65, so maybe 66% efficiency, something like that. Yeah, I think, Sawyer, you got it. That's good. Does everybody get around that number? So again, you read up from 500, you find your pump curve. There's your bottom efficiency, there's your top efficiency, you're in between two lines, so you sort of estimate based where you are partway between the 70% and the 65%. And I'm really hoping people are giving me thumbs up for that. I wish I could see. Okay. So I'll try one more time here. Whoop, sorry. Okay, looks like people are mostly getting it. But I'm gonna say it one more time for Jong Sun just before we move on. So you start at 500 gallons per minute. You read up until you hit your eight inch diameter pump curve. And then here, this green line is the 65% efficiency. This green line is your 70% efficiency. You're partway between that. So your point is right here where your 500 gallon per minute and eight inch impeller pump curve cross. So that's greater than 65, but less than 70. So approximately 66, 67%. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is the exact same idea, but now we're gonna look at um, net positive suction head requirements. And so same idea, start at 500 gallons per minute, read up until you find your eight inch diameter curve. And then you'll notice that you're between the 20 foot and the 15 foot net positive suction head. So maybe you're sitting about 17 feet of net positive suction head-ish. Okay. How does everybody feel about that for that one? Okay, we got a thumbs up from Wanda. These graphs are a little busy, but once you just go slowly through them, they're not too bad. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the next one, which is the total, um, uh, the brake horsepower, pardon me. Same idea, we're gonna start at 500 gallons per minute, read up until we hit our eight inch impeller. And then you'll notice we've got a three foot brake horsepower and then we've got a five foot brake horsepower. We're much closer to our three foot brake horsepower line. So if we assume that it's sort of a linear distribution between the two lines, maybe three point, I don't know, 3.2 horsepower-ish. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so Sawyer so like that. How does everybody else feel with that idea? You are just gonna have to know what the curves are.
Yeah, absolutely. These are estimates. It's kind of in the same way we do the order of magnitude business. So if you really wanted to pump this pump with an eight inch impeller in it and you uh, wanted to operate it at 500 gallons per minute, there's no way you'd go out and buy a motor that could deliver 3.2 horsepower. You'd buy a motor that would be a five horsepower motor. So it's just an estimate that helps us make sure that we're getting the right sized equipment. Does that make sense, Josh? Okay. And if you all are ever, yeah, it, it's when, you know, this is a guideline because if you are the one who's tasked with, let's say, putting in a new pump into a lift station or into a booster station, you're going to use this as, <laughs> yeah, that's good, Eric. You're going to use this as a guideline to help you select the style and size of pump that you want. You are also then going to be working with a pump supplier and they're going to help you select the right pump for the job. So, but you need to understand how they talk about their pumps and what the pump curves mean. And unless you know how to read these curves, you're gonna, wow, that's crazy. Sorry, I just gotta stop. There we go. All right, so we're done with our little inception moment there. Yeah, and see, this is why it was giving me, I don't know why it doesn't show me the background thing, but it's all right. Okay, so we're going to go on to pump curve example number th three. Oh, no, we're not. We've got, well, okay, are you guys okay with finishing this one up? because we're almost at the end of class. Okay. Yeah, this one will be pretty, pretty quick. Okay. Let's finish her. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. So this is another different style of pump curve. This is for a multi-stage pump. And so this would be used for your um, vertical turbine pumps. So in a vertical turbine pump, you can have multiple stages and you would work with the pump supplier to say, okay, I need one stage, I need two stages, I need three stages. So you can change the number of stages depending on the amount of head that you need to generate with your pump. And so they're a little bit different, but not as much. So if we take a look, um, we've still got our pump curves. So you'll notice that on the left hand side, the pump curves are based on um, our impeller size. Okay, so we've got some different styles in there. And then we also have our efficiency curves, which again are located are a bit funny, they kind of are a little bit like a bullseye there in the middle, but you read them the same way. And then we've got our brake horsepower curves down at the bottom. So they're kind of on their own part of the graph, which makes it, I think, a little bit easier to read. So that's kind of nice. And so what we're going to do is we are going to, this is the information for a single stage, okay? So if we want to do more than one stage, we have to do a little math to make this all happen. So the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to find the 7.5 inch uh, impeller. And we are going to do the demand is 300 gallons per minute. And so same idea, we're gonna do the 300 gallons per minute. And we are going to read up until we hit this pump curve here, okay, and my really not straight line, and then we're going to read over to get our total dynamic head, and we can read our spot to get our efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it looks straight. Yeah, this is my excellent drawing on a screen writing. So, can you all? You've got no lines. You can't see. Hmm. Can anyone else see my lines when I draw them on the screen? Huh. Okay. Everyone has to imagine. You basically <laughs> start. Okay. So you start at the 300 gallons per minute located at the bottom on the X axis and you draw straight up until you intersect the correct pump curve. And that's where you are going to read off your efficiency. And so our efficiency is approximately, I want to say 78%-ish. And then I read over and I get a total dynamic head of approximately 32.5 feet. And then again, with the efficiency or with the brake horsepower, you'll notice we have four pump curves and we have four brake horsepower curves. So we're using the second from the top pump curve. So we'll use the second from the top brake horsepower curve. And then we read over. And so our brake horsepower is approximately three horsepower. How does everybody feel about that? All right. Now, this is a for a single stage. So if you can imagine, we've got our shaft of our pump, which is going down into the water, and then we've got a little impeller unit sitting there, and it sucks the water in the bottom, and then it spins it around inside and shoots it out, okay? And then it goes into the system. Now, what we want to do is we want to know what happens. Oh, okay, sorry, we're just going to back up for Stuart. So basically, to find the brake horsepower, you find the corresponding brake horsepower curve that belongs to its particular pump curve. And it goes in order of size. So the biggest horsepower curve belongs to the biggest pump curve. The littlest horsepower curve belongs to the littlest pump curve. So we're dealing with the second biggest pump curve. So now we need to deal with the second biggest curve. All right. So let's go back to our, um, what I was talking about here, where we have, basically, we can have multiple bowls, and we've got three now. So the water comes in the bottom, gets spun around, shot up into the next, gets spun around, shot up to the next, gets spun around, and shot up to the next. And in each one of these bowl assemblies, it adds the total dynamic head, Sorry, that's total dynamic head equals to 32.5 feet. In the next one, it adds another 32.5 feet. In the next one, it adds another 32.5 feet. So every bowl assembly adds more energy head to the water. Okay, so each one is capable of adding 32.5 feet ahead. So then the total head offered by three stages will be three times 32.5, which is approximately, what, 96 feet? Ninety-seven Thank you, Quinn. In addition to our head being added, so cumulative as it goes through, our pump will also need more power. So each stage is going to use three horsepower. So we'll use this stage, we'll use three horsepower. 
this stage will use three horsepower, this stage will use three horsepower. So our total power requirements for operating the pump like this, with it has a three stage assembly, would be nine horsepower. Now, here's where things get a little tricky. What do you guys think happens to the flow rate? We've got 300 gallons per minute entering in the bottom. So I've got 300 gallons per minute popping in the bottom of here. What's the flow rate coming out of the top? Yeah, you guys are absolutely right. It's 300 gallons per minute. So basically the first bowl assembly here allows 300 gallons per minute in and adds 32.5 feet ahead. Now it passes on that 300 gallons per minute into the second bowl assembly where that second bowl assembly adds 32.5 feet of head. But it's not possible for that second assembly to make more water. It's getting the exact same water as what the first stage puts into it. You're just getting 300 gallons per minute. Same thing with the second one, it gets 300 gallons per minute. And so it's just like a pipe, what goes into the bottom of the pipe has to be equal to what comes out the end of the pipe. So even though we are head and our power requirements are cumulative, our flow rates are not. All right, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, the efficiency stays the same. Awesome. Okay, so what we'll do here is we'll take a little break. We're supposed to come back here, I think, at 9.15. Is that enough time for everybody to get a coffee and have a bathroom break and come back? Oh yeah, sorry, 1015, pardon me. Okay, all right, everybody will break now and I'll see you back here at 1015 for more pump action.